Guten Tag, mein Freunde, and willkommen. It is I, your good friend and humble narrator, the foul Quince. So far in our little endeavour, we've tracked the origins of the blues as a recorded industry, the first superstar of the blues in Bessie Smith, the original mad poet of the blues in Blind Willie Mactel, looked at B.B. King's influence and his revival of the Memphis sound, and then gone on to the great Chicago scene in the 1950s and the 1960s through the lens of the rivalry between Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters. Today, we turn back the clock again to the late 20s to mid 30s to look at those practitioners of rural forms of the blues, largely self-accompanied guitarists and singers, who proved so tremendously influential over time. This is The Righteous Boat Jambo, and it's time to talk about the country blues. Papa Charlie Jackson As Charlie Patton was to the Delta Blues, the mysterious Papa Charlie Jackson was to Hokum, a jaunty, saucy form based on double entendre and the sexual innuendo. Little is known of Jackson's life other than he was born in New Orleans in or about 1887 and died in Chicago in 1938. While in New Orleans, he played with King Freddie Capard's group. Many people hold him to be the first self-accompanied bluesman to be recorded. His best recordings are fun, lusty, willfully prurient, and are currently being rediscovered and revived by a number of talented artists such as Blind Boy Paxton and the Carolina Chocolate Drops. Blind Lemon Jefferson one of the most famous of the acoustic bluesmen, certainly one of the best selling, Jefferson spent a long period in obscurity after his death, largely because his style was so inimitable that the generation of bluesmen that followed him preferred to base their styles on easier to imitate players. It wasn't until the rise of rock music and curiosity about its roots that Jefferson assumed his rightful legacy. Born blind in 1894 in what is now the ghost town of Crouchman, Texas, Lemon Jefferson was actually his real name. By 1920, he was playing on the streets of Dallas by day and playing in the rough speakeasies by night. He got rousted a lot and moved from town to town, where his reputation as an entertainer got him plenty of work with the bootleggers. One of the first self-accompanied bluesmen, he was a prolific recording artist for both Paramount and OK, cutting many classics. Of course, as befits a blues legend, a tragic and needless death is inevitable. There's a lot of myth around Lemon's 1929 death, but the most widely accepted is that, returning from a gig in Chicago, he got lost in a blizzard and died of a heart attack. Blind Blake Another of the early bluesmen whose only biography is myth, Blind Blake is most famous for his astonishing guitar technique, which remains influential to this day. He was born in 1896, possibly in Jacksonville, Florida, or Newport News, Virginia, or given his use of Gullah dialect, possibly in the Sea Islands of South Carolina. Blake was one of the earliest recorded bluesmen, laying down his first sights in Chicago in August 1926 and continuing until 1932, when his label Paramount folded in the Depression. It's estimated a quarter of all of the race records, and I'm making a little inverted commas with my fingers here, issued between 1929 and 1932 were on the Paramount label. Blake died in 1934 of tuberculosis, but for a long time the story of his death was the same as the story of the death of Blind Lemon Jefferson. Blind Willie Johnson. There are a few more woeful tales in the blues than that of Blind Willie Johnson, the first bluesman to leave the solar system. Best known for his gospel blues, Johnson's sandpapery voice over which he had total tonal mastery, from a whisper to a scream, and his propulsive slide guitar made him one of the early masters of the form. Johnson's wordless masterpiece, Dark Was the Night, Cold Was the Ground, was sent into space as part of the golden record on the side of the Voyager 1 spacecraft. 
but over his short career he recorded a handful of priceless cuts. Every one of them contributes enormously to the canon of the blues and the later development of rock music. Amongst these are songs covered by Bob Dylan, Eric Clapton, Led Zeppelin and Nick Cave, amongst others. Willie's career was brief. He recorded only 29 songs from 1928 to 1931 before becoming a full-time preacher. In 1945, he was living in Beaumont, Texas, where he had a ministry. Willie's house burned down. Not having anywhere else to go, he slept in the burned-out ruins exposed to the elements. He contracted malarial fever and refused admittance to any local hospital, most likely for being black, passed away on September 18th, 1945. Tampa Red. The most prolific blues musician of the era was Tampa Red, a Georgia-born Tampa Ray, Chicago-based slide guitarist who made over 300 records, plus many more as a session musician. He was most famous for the booming volume of his national resonator guitar, being very possibly the first bluesman to own such a flashy instrument. Red became incredibly popular when he teamed with Georgia Tom Dorsey and played the Hokum Blues. After splitting with Dorsey in 1932, Dorsey going on to develop gospel music as we know it today, Red moved to a more conventional blues style, being an early adopter of electricity, and after the R&B hit parade was established, even landing four top tens on that. He became a very prosperous musician and his house was a centre for musicians to stop by and jam and teach at younger musicians. But his world came crashing down in 1953 when his wife died and he began to slide into depression and alcoholism and having had his last hit in 1960, died in penury in Chicago in 1981. Blind Willie McTell Already discussed at length, Blind Willie in the late 1920s and early 30s established himself as the most cryptic and poetic storyteller in the blues. Largely forgotten for many, many years, although Bob Dylan did shout out to him on the song Highway 61 Revisited as George Sam, which was one of McTell's many aliases, his reputation and myth has been hugely rehabilitated. So much so to the point now he's discussed as a serious rival and perhaps superior to Robert Johnson. It tends to be that English blues guitarists reference Robert Johnson, American bluesmen reference Blind Willie McTell. McTell was well known as a street performer and occasional recording artist right to the end when Booze and Diabetes finally finished him off in 1959. Gishi Wiley a mysterious figure about whom very little is known, including her real name, where and when she was born and died and what she looked like. There are no verified known photographs in existence. Gishi Wiley, her real name was possibly Lily May, was born possibly in Louisiana in 1908. She possibly died in Oxford, Mississippi in 1938 or 1939, but there is a story that she died in 1950 in Burleson County, Texas, after hitting her head in a fall. Her career effectively ended when she stabbed her husband to death in 1931, a crime for which she served two years at most. Gishi only recorded six sides of Paramount at their studio in Grafton, Wisconsin. I'm not sure if it's to some degree fashionable obscuritan revisionism, but Wiley is being hailed as the greatest female country blues singer of her generation. It's hard to argue with that given the dearth of competition and that the wonderful last kind word blues, covered by Rhiannon Giddens and lately Robert Plant and Alison Krauss. Clearly she was a major talent, both Last Kind Word Blues and her last single, Eagles on a Half, back with Pick Poor Robin Clean, are especially wonderful and her murky backstory, or absence of a backstory, only magnifies one's curiosity about where this music came from and where it went. Charlie Patton Often referred to as the father of the Delta Blues, Patton not only gave the Mississippi Blues its first local hero, but one of its primary influences. He was the first to have his music break out of Mississippi to Chicago and New York, the two major northern markets. Patton was also a great and famous showman, who rather than wander and play wherever he could find the work, was so popular he could set a schedule and fee for tours in advance. Patton also didn't limit himself to blues, singing hillbilly songs, pop hits, rags and hokum. 
He traveled once a year to Chicago to perform and had reached New York by 1933. He recorded over 50 sides and was at the peak of his popularity when he died shortly after returning from New York in 1934 from mitral valve failure. John Fogarty later paid for a tombstone in his honor. Memphis Mini. Not only a superb singer, but a peerless guitarist and one of the first blues singers to go electric. Minnie had a long career studded with great records. Just up to the mid-30s alone, where we'll stop this survey, she made fantastic records, but she had a long career after that with many, many more classics. Minnie was born either in Algiers, which is the ward of New Orleans on the other side of the river, or in Tunica County, Mississippi, which is adjacent to Memphis in 1897. She ran away to Memphis to sing on the street at age 13. She began recording in 1929 with her husband, Kansas City Joe McCall, and, and on through to the 1950s. She faded into obscurity, suffering a series of strokes before dying in Memphis in 1973. Minnie was famous for her professional presentation, always elegantly dressed, but woe betide anyone who messed with her. Like Patsy Cline, she had no truck with foolishness. She always carried a pocket knife and a set of brass knuckles, and many's the messer who got laid out with a well-aimed blow from Minnie's guitar. There'll soon be a full-length video on this remarkable and formidable woman. Big Bill Brunzi. Big Bill's career was so long and his legacy so vast and his music so forward-looking, it's hard to believe that his recording career began in 1930. Born near Lake Dick in central Arkansas, he worked the shares, did some preaching, played fiddle in country bands and even did a hitch in the army before migrating to Chicago in 1920. In the big city, he worked many odd jobs and worked on improving his education. He also played fiddles in clubs for homesick Southerns, switching to guitar as taught by Papa Charlie Jackson, and concentrating on country blues styles. Gradually though, he began to evolve a more urban sound, the forebear of the great Chicago blues sounds of Sonny Boy Williamson and Muddy Waters. By the end of the 1920s, Bill was a major attraction known for his flashy dressing, piquant turn of phrase, and formidable guitar and vocal skills. He was reluctant to start a recording career simply because live gigs paid much better, but he dipped his toe in the water at first in 1930. He didn't begin to record in earnest until 1934 when RCA signed him up. From then on through the 30s and 40s in the States and then into the 1950s internationally, he became perhaps the most popular bluesman, unsurpassed maybe until Jimmy Reed came along. His signature tunes are essential listening. One last funny Big Bill Brunzi story, which perhaps I've told before. In 1938, John Hammond promoted the epoch-defining Spirituals to Swing concert in New York and was very keen to have Robert Johnson play. Imagine his disappointment when he found Johnson was full a year dead and largely forgotten in his old stomping grounds. Hammond hired Big Bill to sub for him, but discovered Bill was a very urbane, well-spoken, handsome, snazzily dressed man. Not the rustic, rural, poverty-stricken farm worker with rats in his kitchen that he imagined made Johnson's music. So Bill had to appear in costume as Robert Johnson or at least Robert Johnson as John Hammond imagined he may have looked. At least he got to sing his own songs. Aside from his wonderful catalogue, Brunzi was one of the earliest blues musicians to tour Europe and Africa, which he did in 1955. He died of throat cancer in 1958. Skip James. Aside of Charlie Patton, there are a few more seminal artists in the history of acoustic blues than Nehemiah Skip James. Born in Bentonia, Mississippi in 1902, James worked on road gangs and levee building crews before turning to music. He played in a unique D minor open tuning, and open tuning is where you tune a guitar to play a fully formed chord without pressing down the strings, so an open D minor would mean tuning your guitar to D, A, D, F, A, D, which gives the guitar a dark, slack sound. And commencing in January 1931, after a long career as a famous and influential local musician, 
schooling young Robert Johnson, whom he thought was terrible, and Muddy Waters, when he headed north to Grafton, Wisconsin to record for Paramount. Here, in sessions stretching just a month, James cut some of the greatest blues songs ever. Unlike most people on our list, though, James lived a relatively long and happy life. Despite his image as the dark mage of the blues, as he aged, he actually was quite often a friendly and witty chap. After 30 years of obscurity, James was, however, rediscovered by the folk festival circuit in the 1960s, and he spent the rest of his life travelling the country, meeting old friends and playing for the hippie crowd, which he held in great affection. Sadly, Skip passed away from cancer in 1969. Blind Boy Fuller A latecomer to the scene, not recorded until 1935, Fuller was one of the purest examples of the Piedmont style. A North Carolina native, Fuller was furiously productive and a big seller. A big part of his popularity was his relatively unhoned style, rough, direct and with songs largely about his hard luck life experiences. What makes Fuller significant was that he, along with other artists like Robert Johnson who arose in the mid-1930s, were of a generation of bluesmen who had access to the recordings of their forebears and could learn from them. Fuller, for example, listened constantly to the records of the Reverend Gary Davis. He, like Johnson, was invited to perform in the Spirituals to Swing concert in New York, but couldn't on account of his being in jail for shooting his wife. Fortunately, he only winged her, and he was out in 1940 and recorded 10 or so more sides before he died from complications of syphilis in early 1941. So while being a bit of a rotter, he still made some great records, which all marked him out as an early giant of the blues.